At 10, we have the very latest on two major developing stories at home and abroad. First, a very personal message from Catherine, Princess of Wales, who's revealed she's receiving chemotherapy for cancer. This, of course, came as a huge shock. And William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. I'm live at Buckingham Palace after the King said tonight he was so proud of his beloved daughter-in-law's courage. Also tonight in Russia, at least 40 people are dead after what's being described as the worst terrorist attack in years. <laughs> Panic as gunmen open fire and trigger explosives inside a concert hall near Moscow. The venue was hosting a rock concert and was packed with people. The search is on for the attackers who are believed to have escaped having left a trail of death and destruction at the concert hall. And this is the scene live tonight with the emergency and security services out in force. On BBC London, money donated after the murder of Sarah Everard is distributed among charities for women and girls. The donations came flooding in after anger at police. Good evening. We begin tonight with the news revealed in the last few hours that the Princess of Wales is undergoing treatment for cancer. Catherine made the deeply personal announcement herself in a video message, and this is what she said in full. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This of course came as a huge shock and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment, but most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. The Princess of Wales there in her statement. Uh, Daniela Ralph, our royal correspondent, is here. Um, there's a quiet dignity and a strength in those words. There is, Clive. It is the princess as we have never seen her before in all her years in public life. I don't think she has ever spoken as personally or as openly about how she is feeling, about her family and what is going on in her private life. It is Catherine in her own words and it is extremely powerful. 
what it will also do is go some way to dampen down all of those conspiracy theories and speculation that's been following her in recent weeks. This is a princess who is talking directly to the public. And my report now looks back on what has been an unsettled period for the whole of the royal family. This was the last official footage of the Princess of Wales alongside the royal family on Christmas Day at Sandringham with her three children, who she is now so keen to protect after going public with news of her diagnosis. Back in December, all had seemed well as she spoke to the crowds. Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you to come and say hello to us. Yeah, well, have very happy Christmas. But three weeks later, she was admitted to hospital for major abdominal surgery. It was in her post-operative tests that signs of cancer were found. Tonight, Buckingham Palace issued a statement on behalf of the King. He said he was so proud of Catherine for her courage in speaking as she did and that he remained in the closest contact with his beloved daughter-in-law throughout the past weeks. He also said that he and the Queen will continue to offer their love and support to the whole family through this difficult time. A message too from California. The relationship is still strained, but the Duke and Duchess of Sussex issued their own statement. Harry and Meghan said, We wish health and healing for Kate and the family and hope they're able to do so privately and in peace. But perhaps the most personal message of all came from the princess's brother on Instagram. James Middleton posted a childhood photo with his sister and wrote, Over the years, we've climbed many mountains together. As a family, we will climb this one with you too. The clamour for information about the princess's condition has been intense. This footage, published earlier this week, filmed by a member of the public, showed her shopping in Windsor with her husband last weekend. And this photo, released on Mother's Day, to ease some of the public speculation, did the opposite, with the princess issuing a statement to say she'd made some edits to the image. A turning point appears to have been this Thanksgiving service in Windsor for King Constantine of Greece at the end of February. The rest of the royal family were there, but the Prince of Wales pulled out that morning, very suddenly, due to a personal matter. We now know this was around the time the princess was diagnosed and began her treatment. It's been an incredibly turbulent few weeks for the family. The couple's priority has been to protect their children and ensure they have time to explain what's wrong to Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. They now hope the speculation will stop as they spend time privately during the Easter break. In Windsor, where the family live, there was sympathy and support for the princess. And I think she's actually been very brave to set, sort of set the record straight and I'm hoping now that she will get some privacy for her and her family. It is sad you don't wish that on anybody, with whoever they are. Yeah. Ready? The princess won't be back to a full programme of public duty for some time. We may see her occasionally but only when her medical team have approved. For now, the Princess of Wales wants time, space and privacy to deal with her diagnosis and recovery. Daniela is joined here now by a Fergus Walshaw medical editor. Uh, Daniela, you mentioned Harry and Meghan in your report. This must be so difficult for them being so far away. It is. That statement from California, from the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, came to us a couple of hours after the official statement here, um, wishing Kate health and healing. Uh, what we don't know, though, is when Harry and Meghan were told about the princess's diagnosis. The relationship between the two, the two brothers is still really strained and very poor. And both sides, both Kensington Palace and Archwell, who represent Harry and Meghan in California, both say that they won't discuss any private conversations within the family. Mm. The bottom line from all this is that we now have a clearer sense of the trauma that this family have been going through over the last few days and the last few weeks. Yeah, it's clearly on a personal level been a terrible, terrible time for them. But it's also been a very, very unsettling time for the whole of the royal family. We're in the extraordinary position now, Clive, where we have both the King and the Princess of Wales undergoing cancer treatment. And Buckingham Palace has been really keen to show us the King at work, haven't they? Doing constitutional duties because he is the monarch and they want us to show, want to show us exactly what he is still able to do. There isn't that same pressure on the Princess of Wales and don't expect to see much of her in the weeks to come. She will want to make her recovery in private. Sure. OK, Fergus, just firm up for us exactly what we do know and don't know 
about the princess's condition. So the cancer was found after successful abdominal surgery in January, which was thought to be non-cancerous, but subsequent tests showed that cancer had been present. And the princess is now having what they term preventative chemotherapy. Now, chemotherapy is an umbrella term for any drug treatment which kills cancer cells. It can be given via an infusion, an IV drip into the arm, traditional chemotherapy, or increasingly now targeted treatment via tablets that you can take at home. We're not being told what type of cancer she had, nor what stage it was caught at. I'm not going to speculate on that. Kensington Palace says, like all patients, she has a right to medical privacy. Mm. But the tone of Catherine's video statement was really positive and upbeat. And she's told her children, she said, I'm well and getting stronger every day. Mm. And what's also sad is the truth frankly, that the news of a cancer diagnosis and news of treatment, it's familiar for so many families right across the country. Um, and also having to break that news to loved ones, including children. Absolutely. One in two of us will get a cancer diagnosis at some point in our lives, mostly most of us later in life, but some like Kate earlier and many like Catherine will have to share that diagnosis with young children. Today in the UK, like every day, a thousand people are told they have cancer. It's a staggering statistic. And there are three million people now living in the UK with cancer. And the, the princess addressed them directly at the end of her statement saying, please do not lose faith or hope. You're not alone. I think that's a, a key message tonight. It is very much so. Right at the end of that statement. OK, Daniela Fergus, thank you very much indeed. And we'll have more on this a little bit later in the programme. Now, our other top story tonight is an unfolding tragedy in Russia. The state security services say at least 40 people are dead and over 100 injured after heavily armed gunmen burst into a packed theatre near, near Moscow and opened fire. Now, it happened at the Crocus Concert Hall, part of which is in flames after explosives were detonated. Steve Rosenberg, our Russia editor, has the very latest from Moscow. And there are some upsetting scenes in his report. A Russian concert hall under attack. Gunmen had stormed the venue near Moscow, the Crocus City Hall. They went on the rampage, shooting their way through the building and into the auditorium. There was supposed to be a rock concert here. Instead, this. The attackers walked through the stalls, firing indiscriminately. Dozens of people are reported to have been killed. They've set the hall on fire. The hall's on fire, he says, as more shots ring out. Then, the rush to escape. There's panic, panic, she says as the crowds fled from the auditorium and tried to get out. Soon, the whole building was ablaze. The mayor of Moscow said it was a terrible tragedy. The Russian foreign ministry called it a bloody terrorist attack. I saw how the terrorists came in and started shooting everyone, he says. We were led to an exit, but it was locked. We ran around looking for a way out. In the end, we went into the basement and waited for the emergency services. Police and Russian special forces rushed to the scene. Some of the attackers are reported to have escaped. The search is on to find them. Two weeks ago, the US embassy here issued a warning that extremists planned to target large gatherings in Moscow, including concerts, within 48 hours. It's not clear whether there's any connection between that alert and this attack. Um, the images are just horrible um, and uh, just hard to watch. And our thoughts, obviously, are going to be with the, the victims of this terrible, terrible shooting attack. Who were the attackers? There's been no confirmation on their identities from the Russian authorities. But late tonight, Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack. The scale of destruction and loss of life is becoming clear after an assault on civilians that has shocked Russia. Shock the operative word, Steve. Any word tonight on the whereabouts of the attackers? Did they get away? 
Well, the latest information we have is they did get away, possibly in a white car, so the search is on to find them. Who were they? Ukraine has said it had nothing to do with this attack. And as I mentioned in, the, in that report a short while ago, there were reports that Islamic State had uh, claimed responsibility for the attack on the concert hall. Uh, the Russian authorities have yet to comment on that. Vladimir Putin uh, has made no public comment on, uh, on what happened at the Croker City concert hall, but we're told he's been kept up to date uh, with, uh, with events there. Meanwhile, security has been stepped up here in the Russian capital at, at key installations, so for example at airports, uh, at railway stations. Of course, questions are already being asked, Clive. How is it possible for armed men to get into a, a very prominent concert venue uh, where there were potentially thousands of people attending this concert and carry out such a, a bloody attack? Especially since uh, earlier this month, uh, US diplomats had warned that some kind of attack on a public gathering in Moscow, possibly a concert, uh, was imminent. Now, the Americans were talking about an attack within 48 hours. It didn't happen. But, of course, what we've seen tonight in Moscow was a terrible attack. At least dozens of people killed and an attack which has shocked this whole country. Yeah, Steve, briefly, you mentioned Islamic State claiming responsibility. Um, is that a shock, a surprise, potentially, to people where you are? Well, there were suggestions uh, that uh, an IS attack was possible here, so perhaps it won't come as, as, as so much of a shock. But as I say, the search continues for the attackers, and perhaps we'll have more information on this tomorrow. Sure. OK. That, the uh, live shot there, uh, the scene outside that concert hall security, of course, incredibly stepped up. Thanks, Steve. Steve Rosenberg there in Moscow. Uh, let's get a reaction from Washington with uh, Sarah Smith, a North America editor uh, who is there. And uh, from Kiev, Sarah Rainsford, our Eastern Europe correspondent, is there too. Sarah, first of all, what are the White House saying about all this? Well, here, um, U.S. officials are saying that America does have intelligence, which they believe confirms that Islamic State were responsible for this attack. Uh, and they believe um, their, the statement made by um, ISIS. Our news partner here in America, CBS, has a source who says that there's been a steady stream of intelligence dating as far back as November, saying that uh, ISIS wanted to strike in Moscow and that that intelligence was shared with the Russian authorities under what's known as the duty to warn. So it's being assumed that that warning um, that the State Department put out that um, Steve Rosenberg referred to and um, telling Americans to stay away from large gatherings, including concerts, because the U.S. was monitoring reports that extremists were preparing to strike imminently. It's presumed that that was related to this intelligence about uh, Islamic State wanting to strike in Moscow. OK, Sarah Rainsford, over to you in Kyiv. Um, the Ukrainians were very quick to make it clear they were not part of this. They were not responsible. Yeah, and I think, of course, because Russia and Ukraine are at war, it was inevitable that some might uh, suggest that Kiev was some way involved. We have heard very quickly from here, from officials in Kiev, that that is not the case. The foreign ministry put out a statement saying it categorically rejects any kind of accusation of Ukrainian involvement. We heard from a presidential advisor, too, saying Ukraine has nothing to do with it. He said uh, there was no way that Ukraine would attack civilians in this way and that Ukraine's war with Russia will be decided on the battlefields. Now, Ukrainian military intelligence went much further and they in fact accused Russia of staging this attack saying it needs to bolster support for its war and for mobilization to find more soldiers to actually fight uh, for Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine. There is no evidence of that. Of course, these are two, war the two countries very much involved in an information and psychological war as well as one on the battlefield. So there's a lot that's still unclear, but I can tell you that here in Ukraine, as the news of that attack in Moscow was coming in, there was fear here because people were worried that Ukraine would be blamed and that that would have consequences here in Ukraine, that there could be an escalation of Russia's war on Ukraine, more devastating attacks. Just after last night, we saw 150 missiles and drones fired by Russia right across Ukraine. OK, Sarah, thank you for that. Sarah Rains for their live in Kiev and uh, Sarah Smith in Washington. Thanks to you, too. Well, the big question, who was responsible for what? 
is now being called the worst terror attack in Russia for many years. Gordon Carrera, our security correspondent, is here. So it seems as if the finger of blame is being moved away from Ukraine. The Americans, we heard Sarah Smith suggest, are claiming it was Islamic State. Yes, and in the last hour we've had this statement from so-called Islamic State ISIS saying they were responsible and that their attackers had somehow got back to their bases safely was the language they use. Now, we can't independently confirm that at this point, and occasionally we've seen false claims from the group in the past, so we have to have a bit of caution. However, I think it was always a strong possibility. Why? Well, the nature of this attack, marauding gunmen going around trying to kill as many civilians as possible, that is the kind of thing we've seen ISIS doing in the past. For instance, we saw it at a concert in Paris in 2015 at the Bataclan Theatre, something very similar. So we'll have to wait for further confirmation very important to see what Moscow said. As we heard there uh, from Sarah Rainsford and Sarah Smith, there's been this question and concern that perhaps the Russians might try and blame Ukraine for it. And what would that mean? And because you've got this intelligence that the US clearly had pointing to a possible attack around March 7th on a concert, now that is significant because it suggests the US might have intercepted communications or had some kind of intelligence pointing to this, but the Russians appear to have dismissed it publicly after the Americans went public. So that's going to raise big questions for Moscow about what they knew and how seriously they took it. Which might explain why we haven't heard from Vladimir Putin as yet. So, to be clear, the Americans would have communicated this intelligence to the Russians despite well, the enmity between the, both sides. Well, that's right. I mean, they made it public. So they made it right. public and they put it on their website for US citizens there, that there was this warning. And the Russians dismissed it in a statement. They described it as propaganda. So I think that will raise questions. There's always that question after a, a, an attack like this. Could it have been stopped? But here, if there's signs that a warning was dismissed, that could be very awkward for Moscow and very difficult. So I think it'll be very important to see what uh, Vladimir Putin says and how Moscow responds to this. Sure, indeed. OK, Gordon, thank you. Gordon Carrera, our security correspondent there. Well, as we were hearing from uh, Sarah Rainsford in Kiev, more than a million people have been left without electricity after Russia carried out mass airstrikes last night against power stations and energy lines. <laughs> Ukraine's biggest hydroelectric power plant at Zaporizhia was hit along with the vast dam across the Dnipro River that supplies it with water. Now, the airstrikes caused blackouts across much of Ukraine. Neighboring countries, including Poland and Slovakia, are providing emergency power supplies. And a few of the other stories making the news tonight. Uh, America's top diplomat, Antony Blinken, has accused Russia and China of having cynically vetoed a U.S. draft resolution at the U.N. Security Council that tied an immediate ceasefire in Gaza to the release of hostages held by Hamas. But Moscow and Beijing said the text put conditions on a pause in the fighting and failed to clearly oppose an Israeli offensive in the heavily built-up city of Rafah. Here, West Yorkshire police are investigating alleged racist comments made by the Conservative Party donor Frank Hester about the MP Diane Abbott back in 2019. Officers say they're looking into whether a crime was committed. Mr Hester has previously insisted his criticism of Ms Abbott had nothing to do with her gender or skin colour, and he's apologised. Now, England's manager, Gareth Southgate, has insisted the Three Lions crest is the most important part of the national team shirt. The Football Association has faced criticism of the latest kit from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and the Labour leader, Sakia Starmer. Now, it comes after the shirt's manufacturer, Nike, altered the appearance of the St George's Cross using purple and blue horizontal stripes in what it called a playful update to the shirt ahead of Euro 2024. I think the most important thing that has to be on an England shirt are the three lions. It's our iconic symbol. It is what distinguishes us, not only from football teams around the world, but from England rugby and England cricket. Gareth Southgate, the England football manager there. We're going to turn now to our top story and uh, the Princess of Wales's announcement that she's undergoing treatment for cancer. It has been a turbulent few months for the royal family and a vacuum of information in recent days and weeks has led to frenzied speculation about what's been happening with the Prince and Princess of Wales, as David Silito now reports. 
When, in January, a brief statement was made that the Princess of Wales was to have a medical procedure and a period of convalescence, it was meant to be a chance to escape the daily pressures of media scrutiny. Has become the but what ensued was a deluge of speculation, of conspiracy and debate. Where is Kate Middleton? It's been crazy how much speculation about Kate has taken over the internet. You're seeing it all across the world. You're even seeing people who don't normally pay attention to the royal family getting involved in speculating and throwing theories around. You're also seeing a lot of jokes and a lot of memes. But within that, there is a core group of people, and it's a growing group, of people who are genuinely concerned about Kate and her health. On TikTok, the running total of views of videos about the Princess of Wales has now topped 14 billion. It's a beautiful shot of a mom and three happy kids. One of the drivers of that interest was this photo that was revealed to have been digitally altered. And even when footage emerged of the royal couple at a farm shop in Windsor, there were still those wondering if this was AI trickery or a body double. But the mood has rather changed with the release of the statement filmed by the BBC's production arm. In a statement it said, BBC Studios filmed the message from the Princess of Wales at Windsor this week. We would like to wish Her Royal Highness a speedy recovery. There's also an assurance there are no edits in the video. We just heard, obviously all of us just heard the terrible news. Our thoughts are with the Duchess of Cambridge and her family. And the statement brought an immediate response. Here, the White House with a message of support and a plea for privacy and we will begin with that breaking news. Relentless interest, both from press and public, is always going to be part of royal life, but these last few weeks have been on a different level. A family taking a moment to step back as they deal with what's just emerged has led to a social media storm. But now, the chief executive of X, or Twitter as it used to be, has called for calm. It is, she says, surely reasonable to respect the Princess of Wales' request for time, space and privacy. David Solito, so BBC News. It means so much to us both. We're going to hear from Daniela Ralph in a second, but first Mark Easton is live at Buckingham Palace for us now. Mark, after the King's cancer diagnosis, this another significant blow for the royal family. Yes, absolutely, Clive. It really is another significant blow. Uh, Catherine is such an important part of the royal family, and, and the slimmed-down monarchy uh, means that it's not just a personal matter, it's professional too. That slimmed-down monarchy does look dangerously stretched tonight. Uh, the king, as you say, unable to take part in many public duties. Uh, the, uh, Prince William himself has said he will return to royal duties in the middle of next month when his children go back to school in the middle of April. But, of course, he's going to want to spend considerable time with his wife and be around for his children. Other royals, of course, Prince Andrew has stepped back from royal duties, no longer a working royal. Uh, the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, no longer working royals. Queen Camilla, well, she has stepped up, taken the place of her husband at a number of events. Um, but she is... 76 years old, I'm sure the palace is not going to want to increase her workload any further. Uh, so I, I, I think that there will be a determination in the palace um, to try and do something to ensure there aren't too many royal events. They'll probably be looking to prune back on some of them because it's worth noting that the average age now of the working royals without Kate is 72 years old. Mm. Uh, given everything, Mark, many will m perhaps marvel at the composure and the self-assuredness of the princess in breaking what is dreadful news. Well, I think people will be struck by the, as you say, the, the way that she, she did it. She does appeal across the generation. She is, she is the model of, of sort of uh, wholesome, healthy normality, a, a, a vital dose, I think, of ordinariness in the house of Windsor. Uh, but worth remembering, she is also a global superstar. You know, she's been repeatedly voted one of the most influential people on the planet and she is the UK, according to the, the pollsters, she's the UK's favourite royal. Um, the UK monarchy is weaker without her around, the king unwell, a family riven uh, by scandal and quarrel. Uh, they will miss her and they will be praying that she makes a speedy recovery and a return to public life. OK, Mark, thank you for that. Mark Easton there live at uh, Buckingham Palace.
Well, the video message from the Princess of Wales was made public early this evening, putting an end to weeks of speculation about why Catherine hadn't been seen in public. This is what she said. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. Let's get a final word from Daniela, who's here. First of all, a shout out to the public. Yeah, very much so. And that was, of course, Catherine Princess of Wales speaking directly to the public. Uh, that video message was her attempt, I think, just to shut out some of the noise of recent weeks and tell people how she is feeling, what's going on in her life, how she feels about her family and her children directly to try and block out some of that speculation and rumour that has dogged her and made her so incredibly upset, we know, in recent weeks. This was Catherine, in her own words, a very direct message from her in a way we haven't seen before. And I'm struck, I'm sure we all are, by um, the penultimate paragraph of what she said. We hope that you will understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. Does this statement finally draw a line underneath all the stuff that we've heard, the conjecture, the rumours, the speculation over the last few days and weeks, do you think? I think it goes a long way to drawing a line under it because we have heard from her directly herself in her own words and also seen her. It's a really interesting dilemma at the moment, Clive, for the royal family because um, modern royalty requires the public to be interested in it. It needs public support. And at this time, when everything is far from normal, there does appear to be a huge amount of sympathy and interest in the royal family, helped by Catherine's message today, I think. Uh, but in the weeks ahead, things will continue to look very different indeed. The King, Buckingham Palace, want us to see him carrying out some constitutional duties. We will continue to see him at times. But for Catherine, Princess of Wales, she does want to retreat now. Her and her husband and her three children have two to three weeks off for the school holiday. We're not going to see them during that time. It's only then we'll see Prince William. But even then, his priority remains his wife's recovery. Indeed. OK. Daniela Ralph, our royal correspondent. Many thanks. Now, it's time for a look at the weather and Louise has all the details. Hi there. Hi there, Clive. The picture tells the story. It has been a windy day in the far north of Scotland. Severe gales across Shetland whipping up the seas and I suspect the wind playing quite a part for the start of the weekend as well. A cold, strong wind coming from the northwest. It's going to drive in plenty of heavy showers for our Saturday. Slightly better conditions for Sunday. More on that in just a moment. But low pressure really dominates the story and yes, the sharper showers closest to the centre of that low so on Saturday morning frequent rash of showers into Scotland Northern Ireland snow above 500 meters some of these showers could be heavy with rumbles of thunder we will see further showers moving their way across England and Wales as well accompanied by this strong brisk wind gusts in excess of 50 miles an hour once again in the north but even down to the south 35 mile an hour gusts of winds will make it feel quite cold so temperatures around 9 or 10 degrees but it's quite unusual to be talking about the wind chill at this time of year five or six bear in mind 
that just a few days ago we were talking about highs of 19 in the southeast. So it will be a little bit of a shock to the system. Hopefully, though, on Sunday the low drifts away, the ice bars open up, the winds will fall much lighter, and it will be a sunnier day as we go into Sunday. And with lighter winds, more sunshine, fewer showers around. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it will feel a little more promising out there. Temperatures are expected to rise a degree or so, so we should see highs of 9 to 12 degrees for most of us. Want to know what's in store for the weekend? Maybe it's a bit like the football scores. Look away because... The rain is set to return because early next week it's going to turn unsettled again and it stays cold with those temperatures just below par for the time of year. Clive. OK, Louise, thank you for that. Louise Lear with a weather forecast. That's it. There is continuing coverage on all our top stories, including the latest in Russia and the Princess of Cambridge. Uh, Princess of Wales. Um, that's on the iPlayer and on the BBC News Channel. Newsnight is getting underway, of course, over on BBC Two. But here on BBC One, it's time for all the news where you are. Let's join our colleagues for the latest. Have a peaceful night. <laughs>